Jetzt kommen wir zu den akademischen Keynotes. Und jetzt darf ich Urs Gasser, den Dekan der TUM School of Social Sciences and Technology, auf die Bühne bitten für den akademischen Input, auf den wir jetzt auch schon sehr gespannt sind, ob das auch so goldgräberartig ist oder ob wir da noch ein paar andere Töne her hören werden. Bitte schön. Hello everyone, I'm delighted to be here. Um, I have prepared slides, I have prepared a keynote speech, but I realize we have 20 minutes between now and lunch and two talks, um, and I think I will not do the keynote, but I will take risk. I was listening carefully yesterday where risk was mentioned, the willingness to take risk already in the opening speech was mentioned by our fantastic students. And so I feel encouraged to engage in a little experiment instead of giving the prepared keynote. As I've been listening carefully uh, online and to the wonderful presentations throughout the two days, I start wondering whether it's a good time now to ask the hard question. We heard in the presentations about it's a Zeitwende, it's an age of disruption, discontinuity. We heard about tensions between models of openness, collaboration, global interoperability on the one hand side, but we also heard notions of competition dependence and control. And so as I'm listening to the description of the state of play in which we find ourselves at this critical juncture in time, I start wondering whether the concept of sovereignty is the most helpful mental model we have in response to the challenges ahead. I know I'm provocative, but I would like to take this question seriously for a moment. I'm skeptical whether sovereignty is the most helpful mental frame, mental model we have available to address the realities which include that we live in a world full of dependencies, full of interdependencies. What makes me uneasy about the concept of sovereignty is that it carries a very specific notion of control. If you go back to Roman law, and the question of property as one frame around sovereignty. If you look at international law later on and the question of sovereignty as control over territory, over people and the law, as you progress and look at control over flows of goods, in all these cases our notion of sovereignty is interlinked with the notion of geography. And even if you take the reformulations of digital sovereignty today in our discourses, as vibrant as they are, you start to realize we are making good progress in mapping different layers in the technology stack all the way from rare earth elements to data, platforms, software, up to policies. And I think that's helpful because it helps us better to analyze the dependencies and interdependencies. 
But then we make a step back and invoke the idea of sovereignty and somewhere the European flag or the Chinese flag or the US flag is coming back into play. And if you read the texts and policy statements carefully, we are still somehow stuck in the conversation around digital sovereignty in the thinking and the mental model of the Westphalian time. Now, that may be as it is, but I think there is a fundamental complication that I would like to put forward for us as we are approaching lunchtime. The fundamental complication is that the digital transformation has fundamentally, tectonically changed societies, how we live our lives, how we work together, how we date, how we entertain ourselves. And famously, a sociologist, Castells, has put it that we are moving from a space of places to a space of flows. And that that is the fundamental shift we've seen over the past few decades, so Manuel Castells, as we have and are going through the digital transformation. Now, if that is correct as an observation that we're moving from a space of places to a space of flows, then I think we have an inherent tension with this geography-bound concept of sovereignty. Because remember the picture a few months ago of the dramatic floodings in Germany where you have seen entire villages somehow collapsing in dirt. And to me, this picture is some sort of the symbolization what happens if we don't get paradigm shifts right. If we don't understand that governing flows is very different from governing territory. I think that picture should stick with us also when we talk about the questions we're debating here and today. Flows may need different responses than what we feel inspired by from the Westphalian age. So then the question arises, if sovereignty may not be the appropriate mental frame, or if it may only be one frame and we could benefit from additional frames to be less provocative, where would we take inspiration from? I think we have two possibilities, two opportunities. The first opportunity is to learn from history, to look back at moments where fundamental technological shifts have met new ideas that together then set the stage for a reimagination of what our role in society is. And so what I would propose is to look for such moments of reconfiguration. Think back the invention of the Gutenberg printing press, what it has enabled in, the, in terms of the scientific um, revolution, what it has meant for the empowerment of people, and it, what it has meant and how it has challenged the governance of institutions. I think we can learn from these moments, and I would argue we are in such a moment, the power of imagination. And moreover, I would argue the power to shift the attention from a concept like sovereignty to the question of how can we use technology to bolster to secure, to increase human agency, the ability individually and collectively to act in a highly disruptive world. That would be my suggestion of a reframing of the attention and mental model. 
The second source of inspiration to come back to present time and illustrate this point a bit more is look at what hap what's happening right now in the pandemic age, what happens in the Ukraine. If you look at how different countries have dealt with the fact that suddenly hundreds of millions of children had to be educated without being able to go to school, you see an enormous degree of creativity where in Pakistan kids were using radios and cell phones and um, uh, mesh networks of learning and education to continue to learn. Where in Egypt, in one week alone, with a cloud-based support, 25 million kids got access to educational resources. And yes, Germany, we've been struggling. We have mixed experiences in cities and different London, how well we managed. And I would say exactly because we were constrained by jurisdiction thinking instead of focusing on human agency and unlocking the potential of technology in front of us. The last example I would offer is the Ukraine. I think the strength of the Ukrainians has very much to do that these great brave people have actually embraced the idea of space as flows, even at the moment where the territory, the place is under great attack. Think about the ways that technology was leveraged quite quickly to secure government data or secure financial data to keep the economy running. Or think about the ways in which social media and off-the-shelf drones have been used to document war crimes. Or think about a president that is using social media to speak to parliaments across the world. None of these things, whether it's the pandemic and they could go on with examples or the Ukraine, in my view, are relying of a sense of control over a stock of layers and entire life cycles where this control is related to a particular territory or place. These examples suggest something else. They suggest a more agile, a more dynamic, a more human-centric way to manage flows with all the contradictions that I mentioned at the very beginning. And so I leave you with this provocation, um, knowing it's a bit disruptive. Um, are we so sure sovereignty is the right concept? Thank you very much.